most of you know is a software put out by a gentleman in, in England who pretty much a one-man company. It's amazing the uh, amount of product that he's been able to do uh, by himself, essentially. But he's quite a talented programmer and uh, a good machinist as well. So software has the main benefit of being inexpensive for what you get. It's good value for money. $150. And He's continually upgrading it. There's a good support forum with people like myself, people all over the world who are uh, contributing. And if, if somebody starts out with it as a question, they can post up on the forum to uh, to get help on advice on what to do. And uh, so, just in general, for for what you get, it's uh, it's good. The other thing that is really attractive about it is you can download the software onto your machine and get 40 free invocations, full feature, not limited to 150 lines of code or anything. And you can do a pretty good evaluation because what I did when I was evaluating it, this goes back like three years, I would start it up, I would leave it running on my machine. So unless I had to reboot, I could run one of my evaluation copies for a week. Okay, so you can really give it a great uh, a rundown on it making sure it works for what you do, you can make parts, uh, and, uh, use it for, for learning. So, I'm not being paid to uh, recommend the software, I'm just giving my experience as a, uh, as a program that if you're getting into C and C, you don't want to spend a lot of money to uh, try it out for your, your pretty good product to, to use. Um, so that's the product itself. Uh, what I'm going to go through is, in general, I'm not sure what the audience is, is but uh, maybe maybe people can just raise their hands. Do we have people here who don't have a CNC machine or are looking to maybe learn what it might be about? So we have a few people there, so we'll start with a few people. Mind. We have people that are using other software that might be interested in using this instead. So, Two. Okay. So, what we'll try to do is go through at a fairly basic level. And those of you who are familiar with CNC or run that are already running that stuff, will hopefully, hopefully get some benefit. The other thing I want to do is I want to demonstrate a part that I made using the product on my build. And originally I was going to try to do a model engine part, but all the ones I made are actually attached to an engine. So this is the part I made. It actually goes on to a General Motors engine to adapt an oil accumulator. Bolts on to the engine block just above the oil filter and lets you pump more oil into the thing when your engine's running. And so this is the part that I made. I'm going to demonstrate the process I went through to make this part to generate the code for the part. We can pass it around. But it's, it's not a complicated part, but what I found is that most of the parts you that I make are parts that can be made with a manual mill, but CNC is much easier to do. For example, anytime you have a rounded edge, most of us, you know, manual machinists, you're a thing, your rotary table, or you get there on the grinder or the belt sander, or, the, or you use a, a filing uh, die, a hard die and file around the, uh, the edge to get rounded. And obviously, that's one of the big advantages you get with, with the CNC mill is anything that's, uh, that's round. So if anybody wants to pass it around or look at it, I will. Yeah, I'll just pull up this. Now, this is a CAD drawing. And a couple of things about this is what's called a 2.5D part. Not a 3D part. I'm not. Camvan will do 3D milling. I'm not going to talk about that today, other than to tell you that if you have a 3D CAD system and can generate an STL file, you would be able to mill it using code. Camvan will generate code to do that. It's a more advanced than trying to keep this at a fairly basic level. So what 2.5D means? It's, it's basically milling stuff that if you had three hands and perfectly coordinated, you could do it on a bridge board or a manual mill, three axis machine. Basically means that X and Y, it'll control it, and then Z, it'll control the seats all simultaneously. So that's what we mean when we say 2.5D. 
Now there's some mills that are really 2D mills. It means it'll do the table X and Y, but you have to manually move the spindle head up and down each time you do a pass. I don't think most people would probably be able to do that. Some of the old mills that uh, are around don't have a computer control of the, of the Z axis. Okay, CAMBAM has a basic CAD pack capability involved provided. You can draw some simple parts. You could have drawn this part, but I personally do not use it for CAD. I use DraftSite, which is a free uh, AutoCAD clone. I was able to draw this part after and, and mentally designing at the same time, probably in half an hour. If I already pretty much knew all the dimensions, this would probably take 15 minutes. And so what you get is you end up Doing the, doing the file, and you end up with a DXF file. You can also use D, DWG files. CAMBAM will support both of those. But I'm not going to talk about much about the CAD package. If you don't have a CAD program, or you're, if you're not familiar with CAD, as long as you can draw a DXF file, you can read it into CAMBAM to start the process for, for the machine. So here's my part. And I just drew the bottom part here to mentally understand what the, the Z dimensions were, but uh, I didn't really need that. This is basically what I'm going to be using, and it's because I have top and bottom features that I have to build. There's actually two uh, machining steps that would have to be done. One of the things you have to think about just in CNC, just like you do it manually, you have to figure out how am I going to hold the stock? Do I need a fixture? You know, what are my steps? You've got to really think about that uh, in CNC just as much, or if not more so, than when you're doing your manual machine. So, especially if you've seen the part, you see we've got a contour, we've got a square feature. We've got this uh, hole that goes there, it's actually threaded for a uh, one half inch national pipe thread. <laughs> And we've got a couple of through holes that bolt it to the, uh, the engine block. So that's the part. So what you're going to do, in, and I'm going to sit down while I do this because the table's kind of slow, is you fire up CAMBAM, and you can have, as you can see, I can have two, two different versions of it going. It's not a multi-window screen. And when we have it here, we have a little tour of the, we pull it up and it'll look something like this. You have essentially five areas of your screen that will be used in, in using the product program. This is your main drawing area. This is where all of the input from the DXF file, all the drawing lines, will be displayed. And once you've done that, you're going to see each line or each segment or each circle will have an entry a drawing element which will show up here under a particular layer. We'll talk about layers as well. And then once you've done that and you've got your drawing part the way you need it for machining, you're going to define what are called machining operations or MOPs, or I just say MOP. You're going to have to define the MOPs that will get you the result that you want. Okay, once you've got one of these layers and when you click on it to see what it is, you get area here called the attribute, you'll see the attributes of either that machining operation or that drawing element. And this will also have data entry to allow you to either modify or, uh, or set uh, your parameters that you need for the machining operation. This little area down here will have some help, help information. It's not, it's not as well done as I would like it, but as, as the uh, product development's gotten better. And then here you have error messages and other types of, of, of data that might be of interest to you. Up here you have a typical toolbar. And you have a tab here for your drawing. Over here you have your system area that lets you configure additional things that are you'll, you'll need to. You know, I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff in here, but I'll be mostly commenting about the drawing tab. Okay, any questions on what we've done so far? Okay, now, let's talk about the drawing. When you draw the, in the DXM file, for example, 
you have a number of things that you can sort of get to. You can have circles, you can have arcs, you can have lines. You can have some other, you can have rectangles. Okay. Essentially, when you get it into, um, into, into Kanban, a lot of times you'll need to join these things together and you get what's called a polyline. And a polyline is a very important concept. And I'm not sure if there's a technical description, but it's essentially, if we go into more of a topology, it's a simply connected uh, line, if you will, that is, doesn't have any branches. Okay, so you can join together lines that are end-to-end, -end. they have to be end-to-end, -end, and you can't have any like T-junctures. Okay, it has to be a simple, uh, a simple construction. So essentially, if you think about what you're going to do with your polyline, it's something that's going to guide your tool when you're milling. To uh, so so we have to construct these. When you get it in the DXF file, you'll have all these things separate, and you'll have to figure out how to join them together to get the tool pass that you're going to need. The other thing that you'll have, which I don't really have on this, is you can have points. And the points are useful, for example, if you're drilling, you can define a drilling by either a circle or a point. And it's up to you which, whichever one you want to use. So uh, I don't have any points to find, but it's certainly easy to, to you can find them in the CAD program and they'll show up in the CAD So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take this, when I, wrote, when I did the program, I saved it as a DXF file. Now I'm in my startup screen. I'm going to say open existing file. And here's my DXF file. I click on it, say open, and it brings it in. It looks pretty similar to what we saw in the, in the, in the CAD program. And you'll notice I get a number of error messages here that it says, remember, I had dimensions. Well, the DXF file has dimensions. You don't have dimensions in CAMBAM. The size of the, of the lines are already define of themselves. So the dimension is strictly a visual thing you do in CAD to, uh, to, to verify that your part is what you want. And one of the things that I did, and a lot of the parts that I've made with this, is I'm working on a model uh, 1.5 scale COZO steam engine. In the COZO book, he has drawings of all the parts that you need to machine. But those parts are on, on three quarter inch scale, and I'm building in one and a half inch scale. So that means all the parts that I get from COZO, I have to double. So what I did was, to make sure I didn't screw up, was I drew them right out of the book in three-quarter inch scale, and I would add the dimensions on the drawing to make sure they matched what was in the book. That way I was pretty sure that I hadn't misdimensioned something, it was twice as big. Once I did that, I used the CAD program to double, so I just said scale two times, and, I, and the dimensions would scale it automatically. And then when I brought it in here, I was pretty sure my part would be the correct size. Can I, can I have a question? Sure. I have a problem with mine. I, I scaled, uh, I drew it in 1-1. One, one. Yeah. I dimensioned it, I saved it as a DXF file, and, and I saved it on a flash drive, and then tried to re-import it. And then what happened? Translating it some way where you can't see the part because it's covered up with dimensions. So I tried to re I tried to draw up, upscale it and then and which program are we talking about? Bobcad. Okay. And that probably explained it. I, <laughs> I can't help you. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm having problems with CAD so I can't get into that either. But, um, so what I what I do is I drew the part four times the size and then deep dimensioned it. Yeah. A quarter scale of that to bring the, the dimensions out. Well. I, Tried to export it or import it, change it to a DXF again, and it changed it back to 1 1. Yeah. And I don't know if it's a translation issue. I don't know well, it sounds like, sound like it should work, but obviously with draft side and cam it does work, so maybe that's what you need to use. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, well, just to comment on Babcad, I don't really know. I got a free copy or a licensed copy with the bill I bought. I tried it for, and my training was on Master Cam. You know, Botech school. And I found that the way that they go about generating the code and, and doing the CAM function was pretty alien to me, where 
Cam Bam was much more similar to the way I learned it. So that was one of the reasons I switched to Cam Bam and not didn't pursue the So this, the body this is similar to the methodology that Master Cam used? Well, or at least the part that I use, correct. It, it has, the, has the right. concept of the machining operations is applied to. Structure. Yeah. So I wouldn't, obviously, Master Cam is a lot more capable, a lot more expensive, but it. This is much more intuitive. Let's let's put it that. Way. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, can you change the, the color? Not right now. But can you uh, change the color of the background? Yeah. I will show you, show you right now. You go over under tools and options. You got all your color things in there, depending on what you like. I just use the, the default. I might actually talk about it a little bit here. One of the things that I should mention. I do everything in inches. If you're a metric guy. You can change all your dimensions to work in that millimeters, and it'll generate. The G code that you generate is, uh, doesn't know anything about inches. Or, you know, obviously, you generate a millimeter, you go into mock or your control, it has to say all these numbers are millimeters or inches. So, uh, but uh, the other thing that uh, it, that I use mostly on here is they have in the drawing you can put a grid, and you can specify the spacing of the grid. A lot of times. So you want to use the grid if you're if you're trying to use the CAD feature here. I never use the grid, but they do have a, a thing where you where you when you're trying to manipulate the lines that you want to be able to do a snap. Mm -hmm. And let's see where you have a that's this, this screen is a lot small. You have one where there's a snap to see I turn off the snap to grid. If there's a grid there, whether you display it or not, you want it to be able to snap to the points, like the ends of the line or the center of the circle. So I always keep that true and the snap to grid uh, falls pretty for them. Sometimes when I'm positioning, after I've done all my manipulation, I may want to uh, snap to the grid. Basically, once I've done this, and I just kill this, I've got the, I've got what I want. So, so now I've got my drawing. The bottom part I'm not going to use. That was just for me uh, to, uh, to visualize the Z dimensions. So, and so what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to delete all those lines out of my... <coughs> so you're, that's actually a flat drawing, not a 3D model, correct? Now this is all 2.5D. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to do anything in here about 3D machining whatsoever. So now I've got my, and this is both the top and the bottom. I've got both things merged. Now I'm going to have to do some manipulation of this because I'm going to make, have to do two separate setups. One to do the, the bottom, which is going to be my outer profile and the pocket on the bottom. Somebody's just a park, got back around here. So, right. like the park. <coughs> so the bottom is the, is the, has got that pocket. Anybody who needs to see the park wants to see it? Uh, Okay. So the other thing is, once I got here, I can say view, zoom to fit, and let you work on. I can use the mouse thing to zoom in and out. So it's very, pretty convenient as far as. Okay. So the first thing I want to I want to see is here, here's here's the way I thought about how I'm going to machine this. The first thing I had a piece of aluminum, a little block of aluminum that. I measure it and I say, oh, okay, it fits. Right. And so when I do that, I can define I can define a stock. Uh, but first thing I want to do is I want to show the layers. See, each, if I click on a line here, it shows me that line. Move this out. Okay, and it will show me that it's a it has an ID. Okay, which is a number, the IDs get to be important after a bit, and it says that it's a line. Okay. So what I'm going to do first is I know that I'm going to have to fill that profile all the way around this way, correct? But I also have my square part is going to share this line. Okay, I've got a square, let's see. But so when I drew this, I actually have this line, this defining part of the square, overlaps. So 
So what I want to do is I want to think about, I need to, I need to do, separate those two out. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a second layer. So what a layer is, a layer is just a container for lines, or polylines, or part of the drawing element. And once you do that, you can, if they're in different layers, you can control what's displayed. So, and I'll show that one side. So what I want to do is I want to go over, I'm going to right click on layer, and I say new layer, and I'm going to call it bottom. That's basically, I can call them anything I want. And, I, and the, the zero comes in from the, uh, and I can rename that top. Okay, just, let's, let's rename, I'm going to try that. Call it top. Okay, so here's my, here's my, the thought, I, the thought process I went through is on the top, what I want to do is I want to mill out the square part and I want to drill the center hole that I'm going to tap for my pipe thread. Yes, sir. You have to define the size of the stock so that it knows... I don't have to. You've got waste material and lean in and all that. I have, I, I do it visually, you know, I'm going to get to that. I'll show you how you do it. It's mainly, when you're doing 2.5D machining, the stock is strictly for your own visualization. But yeah, we'll define the stock on this. Because a lot of times you'll need it to see how, how, big a cut you're, how big an axial cut you're taking with your mill and make sure you're going to remove all your stock. So, obviously, until you measure your your stock material, you're not going to know what it is. So obviously go out to the shop. I found a chunk of aluminum that was big enough. I measured it and I stuck, stuck it in there. And I'm not going to do that here. What I did is I'm going to sort of go through the steps that I went through, some basic steps. And I have my completed Kanban file that has everything done because it, it was a fairly lengthy operation. To, uh, but I basically want to show you some basic concepts that you have to do to manipulate your drawing prior to defining your machine operations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I've got my layer, and one of the things now about layers is, you can see this is green, this one's not, you always have a layer that's the active layer. And what the active layer means is anytime you do any kind of manipulation that creates a new drawing element, it will go into your active layer. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I want to create, I want to... Essentially, in my bottom, pretty much everything, the top. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to move everything to the bottom layer. There's a lot more stuff to do at the bottom. And I can just drag it into the bottom. Okay, now my top is empty. And you'll notice the bottom layer has a different color. That's how one of the ways that you can tell when you're, when you're showing all of your layers what's in the top and what's in the bottom. So what I want to do is I want to do, I want the circle to be part of the top. So I'm going to move that circle to hopefully So this works just like the, now I'm going to set the top, I'm going to right click, I'm going to say uh, set as active layer do a control and then and then I'll do a control B. Now you see because the uh, and you'll notice that I have since I have circle selected it now turns to red. That tells me what my current element is. Then the other thing I want to do is I want to get my square. Okay, but I want to keep the square in the bottom as well, so I'm just going to copy. And when I hit control, if I want to select multiple items, I hold the control key down. I'll do a control C and then go up to the top. Do a control V. And now I have three parts of my square and now and then my circle. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the top and right click and I'm going to say, say hide all but this. So now the only things I'm concerned with 
are the parts that I'm going to do for my first machining operation. And now I need to connect these two. I'm going to go up here to my drawing. This is draw a polyline. And because I did snap to point, I can, I can snap to this. I can click on the mouse, draw it over here, snap on there, click again, and then hit enter. And I've got my, and then I got to go up here and hit escape to get out of my drawing. So now I've got my things that I need for the top. And you didn't bring that long line from the bottom because it was longer than your square, is that correct? Right, the one at the, the top yeah. of the thing I didn't copy. Now I could have, True. and what I could have done was, and I, I might should have done that, I, if, if the thing is too long, what I could do is I could select the two, I can select two elements. Let's just assume that this one was extending out here. Yeah. I can go over to edit, and I can say uh, break, it at that break, break at intersections. Okay, now they did that, and I have to put a tolerance in. It says how close it has to be to be considered. I usually use uh, a hundredth of an inch, or but you know, depending on. Okay, and if I did that, you can see that it didn't. What would have happened was this line would be broken into two. I would have another line here. A line here, and I would delete this line. Okay, but now, now what I need to do is I need to be, I need to make what's make a polyline because what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want to go around the whole circle, correct? I want my mill to be following that square to mill it out. So now I need to join the lines, and I can select. I can either select up here or I can select on the screen. Sometimes it's easier. You notice that the one of them is already a polyline. And now I'll do edit join. I just use control J. It actually will remember your last tolerance. You know, join and, stuff. and now you'll see that my four lines or polylines have been replaced by a single polyline, which is selected. Now I'm ready to do some milling, and like I say, typically I'd want to do my stock. Okay, and I don't remember what my stock was, but what I can do is I'm going to define. Now I have my top. Okay, so now now let's think about the types of milling operations you could do. Okay, and those are across the top here. You can do what's called profile. I think most people are familiar with a profile. A profile will follow a polyline. The polyline can either be closed or open. Okay, this is a closed polyline. And I could go on either side of it. Okay? And then you can do various things. So the so essentially that's just giving a, a guidance for the tool. Okay, I can do a pocket. Once again, I can do a pocket on this thing, but the pocket is always on the inside of a closed polyline. So you can't do a pocket unless it's closed. And if I select this polyline, you go over here, it says closed true. Now a lot of times what might happen is when you're doing your CAD program, maybe when you join it, when you drew it, the lines had a little space or they had an overlap, something like that. If you come up here and you think you've got closed and it's not closed, CAMBAM won't generate the code for you. So a lot of times you have to zoom in real close, do some trimming, do some joining until you get your closed polyline through the pocket. Okay. So I always, even even on a, on a profile, I always want to, if I'm doing it on a closed line, I want to make sure I'm closed. Okay, and then it can, but if your tolerance is uh, too large or too small, it might not. And sometimes it's completely joined, you can't find anything, you can go over there and set it to true. Uh, it just depends on a lot of the things when you're working with real small uh, tolerances or you've made it with a whole bunch of small uh, line segments, you'll find that sometimes it won't work, especially sometimes you're trying to do a, a by hand a tangent to a circle and you don't quite get it on there. So that's one of the reasons I like draft site or drawing. Or It'll do a, it'll snap, it'll snap to your attention line. So, so How do you spell graph site? I'm sorry? Graph site? Graph site. D-R-A-F-T-S-I-G-H-T. 
It's, it's the same company. It's Dassault Systems, same people that make uh, SolidWorks. It's a free download, auto, auto, and clone. Pretty, pretty damn capable. I haven't found it. Can, can I, if you've got a daughter fragment of the line that's somehow attached there that you can't see, could that be the cause of the, of the uh, Potentially. Sometimes you get, sometimes on drawings I get phantom lines that are invisible. But when some, what you can do is you can just click up and down, and if you don't see something go red, I just delete them. So, so, uh, depends on your drawing program and how meticulous you are. <coughs> Okay, and then uh, we have an engraved mop. Now, what the engraved does, you can engrave text with this, but the difference between a, uh, a a profile and the engraved is the profile offsets your your path by the diameter of your tool. Engraved will follow the tool. So sometimes, even radius. though, no, but yeah, by the radius. I'm sorry. The uh, but the engraved will follow the line. So for example, sometimes you find you want to cut a slot. Well, if you make if you make your drawing smaller than the the slot, sometimes with a slot you just want to draw a line and you use profile to uh, do your slot. Or you could use a profile, it depends on how the width of the slot versus the if you want to just do a single pass, it's just as easy to uh, probably just do it with the uh, engraved. Or if you're doing text. But the engrave has a lot is more limited in terms of the types of, uh, of parameters that you can apply to it. And then you have your 3D profile, which we're not going to talk about. But if the way Cam Man will do this, this just determines how to how to do a 3D. If you have an STL file, which you can read it. And then the other one, which you use a lot, is your your holes. We'll show you. We'll show you. Wait, anybody any questions as we've gone so far? Um, you mentioned small features. What's the smallest um, value? Does this go to ten thousandths of an inch? Um, you can, yeah, you can actually, uh, you can set in the options what the tolerance on the G code that you want. So if, if your machine will hold tenths, you can go down to tenths. I set it just to, to uh, I use four digits on my bill. Right. It's not probably accurate. Probably accurate. <laughs> my bill is probably accurate maybe to six or seven tenths. I haven't really made it. And yeah. locomotive parts, I don't care. You know, thousands would be plenty. But, uh, okay, so what I want to do now is I want, I'm going to define a stock. And one of the things I, I think that's about an inch and a quarter wide, but one of the things that has tools is measure. Kind of useful. Maybe I can click over here, click over here. And it's one and a quarter inches. Now, obviously, uh, I didn't get, this is not the most recent uh, version of Kanban that, that, whoever, that uh, Ron downloaded. This was one version older. So the newer one actually shows you the thing right on there as you go. So it's just a little enhancement of the uh, But anyway, so what I can do is I can define, you notice when I define the, <coughs> actually I clicked on it, you see it actually. So when I clicked on it, it uh, seemed that the mouse must have clicked on it. So I don't really want to use a popular or very details. But you'll notice that it created something called a part. Okay, so a part is a way, it's just a tool that allows you to organize your mops. Okay, now because I'm so. It's up to you whether you, it'll always, when the first time you define a mop, it will give you part one, which you can rename. So I'm actually rename it to top, so it'll match my. And then I'm going to have another part that's going to be bottom. Okay, and once again, there's an active part and you can assign the mop part. So what I want to, so what I need to do here is I need to build the square and let's say that my my block of thing is two and a half inches square and I can define my stock either at the part level or the machining level but I'm going to do it in part so now you notice I have a thing for stock and 
stock size. And let's just say for the sake of argument that it's three inches square. You can define the D dimension as well. So you notice it always starts off there. Well, obviously I don't want the I want it to, I want it to be centered. So now I have to go to the stock offset, which I need to move the x one and a half inches to the left. Let's say minus one point five. Okay, I can 
inside outside. It has to be outside. Okay, so you need to make that. What are the what are what are the what are the things that you would think you'd want to specify? We need the tool. All right. So now I'm going to do it exactly. So what I'm going to do is all the way to the bottom. Somewhere. Oh, it's the second zero down right there. You just want to pass. Okay, so my tool diameter, I'm going to use a half inch. Uh, I'm going to use a, I use a two, half inch two fluke to mill, I believe, to do this. So I'm going to put 0.5. And I have to give it a tool number. So I'm going to give it as a 1. And what are the tool numbers used for, anybody? Well, it has to be for a tool change, whether you've got a manual tool change. Because what happens is, <coughs> what CAMBAM does, if it's two consecutive mops that use the same tool number, it won't do a tool change. Okay, so you can do multiple operations with the same half inch uh, cutter by keeping, by either leaving the tool number zero or making it the, the same. Okay. All right, so now that's the first thing. What else do I need to know? I need to know how deep I'm going to cut this profile. And you'll notice on our drawing here, we're going to cut it. Okay, so hey, that's 0.85. That's our depth. No, I'm sorry, 0.65. I'm sorry. 825 is the whole. All right. So I need to say target depth. Target depth needs to be negative. Everything is measured down with the z-axis. So my target depth is going to be minus 0.625. All right. So now, I, and now the other thing I need to know, uh, how fast am I going to turn my spindle? Well, my mill will go 4,000. But it's probably a little too high for even an aluminum for what I have. So I think I'm going to put, I'm going to go up to my spindle speed and the spindle direction is on the spindle speed. I think I'll make that three times. Okay, so now that gives me my basic thing for the power, and now I need a feed rate. Well, how fast am I going to feed this? And a lot of that's going to depend on. How deep a cut, what my axial engagement, everybody understand axial engagement, that's how much of the side flute you're, how, how far you're going in, obviously the depth of cut, the number of flutes. So how do you do that if you're used to manual milling? Well, if you're manual milling, you probably do a lot of, you have some formulas that you learned in school or in the book. But a lot of times if you're on the bridge port or your manual mill and you're cranking it and you hear, you hear a noise or it doesn't feel right or the chips are coming out the wrong color, you change something, right? Because you, you're, you're going by feel. On CNC, you can't do that. Okay? So what, hap what actually hap you need to do is you need to be a lot more conversant with feeds and speeds. And when I started with my mill, I broke a lot of bits. <laughs> Okay, because I didn't have the feed and speed right, and it varies by the material you're doing. Are you using carbide? Are you using high speed steel? Are you using a cobalt drill? Are you using. So, the software I use is uh, called G Wizard. Okay, and I'm, there's other products, but if you're not an experienced machinist and you, and you don't have a lot of feed and speed, I recommend that you spend a hundred bucks and you buy this thing from. Uh, you can look it up on the, uh, on the internet. What, what I found was that after I started using that, I didn't break any mills due to having bad feeds and speed. I still broke some by jogging it into the park when I wasn't looking or hitting the wrong jog key on my mill, but I haven't broken any because I over ran it. And what G-Wizard will do is it will give you a good conservative or aggressive, you this, but what you do is you put in the parameters that you want. How, you know, do I want to do a deep cut and a, and a low axial? Do I want to take a lot of layers going around? How do I want to cut this? You know, what kind of mill I have? What's my material? So I'm just going to put some numbers. I'll show you the numbers that I actually use because I have a finished CAMBAM program that I'll pop up after we go through some more of this exercise. But that's 
one of the things, if you're new to CNC machining, that you have to be very aware of, or especially if you use expensive carbide, when you break it, most of them cost 10, 15, 20 dollars for, for a, uh, especially the little tiny ones, the little tiny ones, or even a small, usually used to use small uh, 116 bits. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to say, Typically what I like to do is I'll say, I'm going to, I'm going to go around this and I'm going to use a 50 thousandths depth of cut. I'm going to go around 50 thousandths each time. Okay, and then I'm going to lower the Z, I'm going to go around again until I get to my bottom cut. That's one way of, of, uh, of doing it, which is, for, for a one-off part is not, it's not bad. So what I'm going to do down here, I have to find depth of cut. I'm used to, uh, I miss it somewhere. You can't think of it right there. It's like it up from the bottom. Down for it. Except there's a depth increment. Depth increment. At least on a big screen, you can have the whole thing up there. So I'm going to put. Okay, so I'll go around one thing, and then, and I've got my target depth, so at this point I've got basic information that I can probably generate by tool paths. So I go up to machining. Do you have to put cut width in as well, or? I will eventually. Okay, not yet. Okay. Because, well, it knows, it knows the diameter of the tool, so I'll show you what happens before we do the cut bit. Cut width will let you go multiple passes on the outside. So I'll do generate tool paths, and you'll see that it's going around. And one of the things that's interesting people don't realize is when you see you've got a square corner, the tool path is actually an arc. And it does that because for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's shorter than going out. Secondly, it doesn't cut into your stock as much. And third, it doesn't, you don't get deceleration and acceleration of your tool, so it actually gives you a smoother path to cut a another round of corner. Sorry? Can't see it? I know you can see it. Okay, so what I, I can do over here, I can say view, and I can say show cut widths. Okay, now it's going. Okay, so that is showing my cut width. You can't really see the stop very well either. It's probably because I didn't the stock, I have the stock over here. Because I put the stock in the, in the park button. So as you can see that if I cut this, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a trough. Because I haven't, because my tool is going to go down to the depth and I'm going to have a little square inside a little with a little boat around it. So what I have to do now is I have to make sure I remove all of that stock. That's okay. And you'll notice that I'm cutting full width, which is a you know, slot cutting. Okay, so, so getting back to the gentleman's question, I have to change to tell it to go out and make multiple passes around, taking, so I use that with the cut width. So what the cut width is saying is, we got, you know, use that tool, but make my tool path as wide as my cut width. So now that's, so that's it looks like I, I've got a half inch, it looks like I've got about a, a half I've probably got at least three quarters of an inch at the minimum that I want, so I want my cut width to probably be an inch and a quarter. And would it be just as easy to make a uh, polyline the size of your stock and just cut a pocket to that depth? Because then it's going to pocket that out. Well, the problem with the pocket <coughs> is the pocket with a round tool is going to leave a corner. Warm. So then you have to use an overcut. The other thing I don't like about using pockets is it always starts at the starts at the center. You don't get as efficient a tool path to work. So I would I try to avoid using a pocket if I can use a profile. Pocket's good for actually cutting pockets, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Maybe and also you can use it for facing. Although I don't use it for facing either. So let me find my cut width, and we'll see what happens. Step over. Step over. Who owns the? Who's that? He's 
So now let's make an inch and a quarter. <clears throat> now I go up to machining, I'll say generate tool pass again. stocked up down here. Personally, I wouldn't lie. I could just knock that off the hammer. That's so you cut off with your uh, profile. It's off the yeah. finished part anyway. So. Well, off. Your stock is always excited. You, can you, can you yeah. also yeah. Can your cut in or cut out profile? That's what we do. I know that, but I mean, instead of doing the hot first, I mean, you know, yes. wouldn't it create it? Based on knowing the stock geometry, go it automatically. No, the Cam does, does not use the stock. Yeah, that, it, the stock that we have here is strictly for you to visualize okay, what we're doing so here. It just recognizes the shape. Yeah. Now the physical. stock is used in the 3D to because it has to know where the stock is on the 3D. But here it's up to you to manually figure out how many passes the jet will take to. Uh, let me do a let me, let me do a view. Okay, so now we can see that our we've, we've got enough passes to, and if I want to see, well, how big how big a cut am I taking here? Okay, so I'm going to do my tools measure again. I go over here. Measure what my how far in I'm going. Okay, that's like about two hundred thousand. Okay, so that becomes my axial engagement. And this is a number that I can then plug in to I can plug in my fifty thousand depth of cut and my and my uh, uh, two hundred thousand axial engagement, my aluminum, and it will tell me what I want for a feed and a speed. Brings me the thing that we didn't put a feed rate in here, but let's say it's aluminum and you can cut it pretty fast. You've got 30. And you go right there. So 30 is the default, and you can set a default. Uh, you can set your plunge feed rate, and so I need my cut feed rate somewhere. I see a feed rate up there. Top. Top right there. Okay, well. 30 might be, yeah, uh, I, I, I just, I usually do something like that. But anyway, you can set it. Okay, so that's going to essentially bail out my, my square. That's what, you just for a minute? Yeah. If, as long as you're, as long as you set it to be English, English if you, if you, uh, if you're working in millimeters, it would be millimeters per, I guess, it would be a much larger number. So, we're much slower speed. so that's my profile. You get the idea of how you do a profile by adjusting those types of parameters. Now the other thing. What about roughing and finishing on that? Okay. The if I put a rough. Okay. If I want to do a rough saddle using a rough a corn cob mill, people familiar with those roughing mills. What I can do is I can go over and I can put in a roughing clearance. Typically, the roughing and finishing doesn't have any, it only has something to do with 3D. It's in there for future future use, so you can leave anything on, but I can put a roughing clear. Let's say I want to run this fairly fast, I'm not worried about my, but I want a nice finish on, on my square, which I didn't. Let's say that I put a 5,000 roughing clear. Now I run my tool pad again. And if I zoom in, You'll notice it's left five thousandths away from my. Now, how would I build the last five thousandths? Do another mop and then uh, do it without the offset. That's right. I would use a five thousandths mop. I would find another mop. I'd probably use a higher speed. I would use full depth. 
and no tool cut off or no offset. You just do the. I do no. I do no. Cut width would be zero. Saying I would just go. I'd probably go faster and have a higher speed, speed because it's a very small Definitely. engagement. <laughs> Make it too small to run. So you have to be careful about your finishing. <coughs> but I would just go around full depth. I have to make sure my flutes are being there long enough. I need to have fairly long end mill. It has to be at least a, this is a six, you know, five eighths. My flutes have to be at least five eighths long. And I would go around with the second mile. I didn't do that with this because it's a, it's a, it's a motor part. So there's, there's nothing really critical about this. Uh, Everybody, everybody clear on the roughing finishing type stuff about what we did? Now, next thing. I have a pipe thread <laughs> hole that I want to drill here. Okay, now, I don't know if you guys know what the tap drill for a one half uh, NPT uh, tap drill is. Anybody know? That's .709, 69. I believe, if I remember your number right. <laughs> 4564s. How many of you have a drill bit that's 4564s in your... There we go. I'm sure there are people. All right. Well, I don't happen to have one. Hey, dude, you got a milling, CNC milling machine. I have, a, I have a CNC milling machine. So what I can use, I can use an interpolation with a helix and bore this thing out. Okay? And I can do that two ways. I can use a... Use an inside profile and do a spiral, you know, spiral it in. But Cam Bam has a nice little thing for doing that. We're using a drill mop, so I'm going to find a drill. And what I'm going to do now is instead of I have what's they have something called the drilling method, and it's set to spiral mill. Let's see if we wipe this out. Okay, so when I have something with an option, I pull this up here. <coughs> okay, most of the time you're milling, you're going to use a can cycle with a drill bit. It's going to either generate a G81 for a straight drill or a G83 for a pick. So you can either pick drill or you can or you can just push it on through depending on your material and how thick it is and what the speed is. Okay, in this particular case, I can either do spiral mill, and I can either go counterclockwise or clockwise. Well, the typically what I like to do is in a CNC mill. Most of the time, you want to do climb milling. Okay, so I'm going to go around this circle with my two flutes, the same end mill. Okay, and I want to do climb milling. I need to go around in a counterclockwise. Right. So I'm going to specify spiral mill counterclockwise. I'm going to use my same tool, and so my, somewhere down here, I'm going to be able to specify my tool number, and I'm going to use the same tool, my half inch two flute, because it's, it's center cutting, and he's got a bunch of stuff to find as a tool crib, so what's going to do? Five. The tool number, I can, since it's the same tool I use there, I could, if I was confident in everything, I would just let it run. But it, you know, if I'm if I'm doing it as my first part, it's a one-off. A lot of times I want to have it stop. So in this particular case, even though it's the same tool, since I have, since I have to manually change my own tools, I don't have a carousel. I can specify as to tool two. And that way my mill will say it will stop and do a tool change and I can stop it in single step. Another other ways of making it stop between operations, you can put in an M1 or an M0 and it will mill in your manually in your, in your G code and have it log between operations. And now it's my dip. So what am I drawing again? 0.85. And what I did was I actually made it 0.86 or a little bigger because I wanted to make sure it broke through the pocket. <coughs> make my pocket a little bit deeper or this a little bit longer. It's a non-critical part. So I just choose. So I'm going to put it at 0.86. Target depth. Go back to this side. Once again, my... my you were there. Go back down. There. Okay. Down. 
It's right above your tool, uh, where you pick your tool. Minus again for target depth, point eighty-six. I have to give it a depth increment. How deep am I going to go each time I go down? I'll use the same 0.05. Sorry. What's that? It's not green. How does that input the target depth? Yeah, he was still in that cell, so it. <clears throat> yeah, well, what happens is uh, I think some of these things that were there, they're things that can be options. Mm -hmm. So he's at, I think it was that one where he set up some kind of tool uh, that he's using a different system. Depth increment, 0.05. And I have to put in my speeds and feeds again, so I'm going to use the 3000. Anyway, you just have to remember, you have to keep doing all your speeds and speeds. But in any case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I can fill in more stuff, and I want to, once again, I want to use my G wizard to you know, figure out now if it's a half inch. I'm essentially slotting because, um, you know, it's a generate tool pass. And now, one of the things that you can do is I can hold down my control key, or my control shift key. I think you still have the rest of the time. Sorry? I wonder if it's still left in offset. Okay. No, that was this is a different model. Okay. Yeah, I have the roughing cut. I'm not going to do it. You'll notice I can, if I hold down the Alt key, I can use the mouse to zip, zip around here. And I can see my spiral. I can see my paths in here. <coughs> the other thing I can do, I can go up to the very top here. <coughs> One of the things that says tool, tool path visibility, this is set to all. What I can do is, I, and this is what I use a lot, is do selected only. And now when I go down here, and I select drill, I can, I can zoom that in. And you can see there's my spiral. You can see how it cuts the, the spiral. But this is pretty useful, and it will show you the depth, too. I can, Go this around and I can actually. Now, one of the things that unfortunately CAMBAM doesn't do, the tool measure doesn't work anything except for the X, X Y plane. So, uh, just have to be sure, sure that the tool depth is. Uh, mm. Okay, so that's my, those are my operations for my top. Yeah, all right, question. You got a thread miller or I mean, would you tap it? You can do thread milling. Uh, there's actually a plug-in that somebody has written for CAMBAM that you can you can plug in the info. I haven't used it. I don't have any thread mills. There are people. It's, essentially, it's doing the same thing. The difference with a thread mill is is you have to have a lead in and a lead out so that when you retract, it, it comes out of it. And you have to feed it in as a with a type of lead in so that you don't plunge straight sideways. You have to, do, you have right. to start in the center and then. The tool has to move out to get to the proper thread depth as a spiral in at the bottom. So there is a, a wizard that somebody has uh, has written. I think I'm not sure where, where it came, whether it came from Andy at uh, Cambam or somebody else wrote it. Uh, one of the features they have here is you can you can write scripts to do things that Cambam doesn't use using either Visual Basic or Python. There are people that have contributed scripts to do. Special stuff. I have a lot of myself. How about rigid tapping? I'm sorry. Rigid tapping. Solid tap. Rigid tap. It would have to be up to your machine to do it. And presumably, I mean, rigid tapping is typically no more than this. You just have to. Uh, usually, it's the uh, CAMBAM won't generate rigid tap. You have to figure out the spiral and the uh, and then your mill has to have a set of servos where it can stop and reverse out. So. <clears throat> it's really my mill wouldn't be able to do it. I'd have to have a tapping thing. Uh, what are you tapping I head? Yeah, I'd have a tapping head. Yeah, and, and Mark three uh, up until now doesn't do rigid tapping either. I 
We'll find out. I think maybe we'll maybe Mach 4. Mach 4, four maybe. We'll, we'll find out. We're waiting one. Looking at Mach 4, it's not going to be for hobbyists. What they're saying. Well, I think yeah, they, they are introducing the copy version today, so. I think, I, think, I think your bill has to be able to do it. You have to have a servo yeah, yeah, spindle. Or, you know, my, my bill doesn't have a servo spindle, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be an interest. But I could do thread milling if I needed to, and I bought the thread mill. And I, you know, of course, yeah. thread mills are expensive, and if you screw up and you break them, they're <laughs> a lot easier to break than uh, the thread mill. You can do single point then too. Yeah, yeah, you can single point thread mill, and the Mach 3 will, uh, actually has a wizard built in for uh, thread mill. Okay, so now, now what we're taking your thunder. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now what's, what's happened is we milled off our our top, and now I need to do the bottom. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to go to my bottom. I'm going to say hide all of this. Okay, I'm still showing the, the stock. I can find a different stock for. Now the way I did the way I did this in in uh, when I was making this part was I had my square and I knew my zero. So what I did was I chucked it in the vise with the square against the, the stock. So what that meant was. I took it over here, I did a move of my, just of my stuff here, to a full M, I took this point here, and I moved it up to zero. Okay? Now if this wasn't a symmetric part, would you have to flip it over? I had to flip it over, yeah. This is now I'm looking at the bottom. Well, remember, I've already, zero, I've already zeroed my mill. I've got my vice stop against the fixed jaw, and here's my fixed jaw. Which is the mirror image the drawing. The drawing. Well, it's a square image. It doesn't matter. I don't have the mirror image. Okay, but if it was non-symmetric, cut the ears. The ears are in there. Well, once again, it's a square, so. Oh, oh. No, you right. know, obvious, obviously, if it were. A I'm radius a, part or something like that. You different. Do well, yeah, I would, have, I would have to okay. flip. The hole is symmetrical that you drew, but the slot is. So it doesn't matter which side. Of the right, because, yeah, yeah, I mean, I have a square inside a square. I can put it anywhere I want. So right. what I'm saying is that now because my machine zero is here, I don't have it. First, first of all, once I put it in a vise, trying to get an edge finder against that square, it's underneath another piece. So I have to tank my zero. Now, obviously, if I couldn't do it, if I didn't have the stop and whatever, what I would probably have to do is have a perfect square with that square in the center and then I could, you know, and then I could measure the edge finder on the, on the other part of the stock. But this is just a, a random piece of the uh, stock. So, so I put the square against here. I don't really, you know, now, now I can move my stock over. <coughs> and it was a different piece. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of ignore, you all know how to, everybody knows how to do the cut widths and everything else, correct? Mm -hmm. So you would draw your stock where it was inside the stock and you would go. So I'm going to turn off the stock and view the stock. And just concentrate on what we've got here. And what I want to do is I, I need to do three operations here. I need to build this profile. Profile here and notice it hasn't been joined. So what I need to do, I need to make a closed Polyline. <coughs> I hold my control key down and I select all my pieces. So I turn the lights down. Control J. And now I've got the bottom. Okay, Now my pocket, I have to have a closed polyline as well. So I'm going to join those. Okay, so for you guys in the front, you can still see the right. Makes it a little easier for us to see. So my three operations are: I've got a pocket here. I mean, I've got a once again, I have a profile operation here, very similar to what we did before. Now I've got a pocket. 
So we'll talk about the pocket operation. You notice it was, I believe, 0.4 deep, correct? So now I'm going to specify my pocket. And I can use the same tool. Once again, there's no inside outside, it's always inside. I'm going to specify the depth of cut. Final depth anchor. Okay, final depth anchor, that's, that's as if you want to take a smaller cut at the bottom for whatever reason. And there's a bunch of stuff that you can do here. But let's do. Spindle speed, well, I'm not going to worry about that. Spindle direction. Top surface is zero. Target depth. Target depth. Minus 0.4. I use my tool number again. It is one. Same tool. And my tool diameter is 0.5. how deep I go each time around. And now I'll generate my... And actually, you notice what I did here. You notice it's still in top of the part. I want it to be in my bottom part. So I want to do a new part. Call the bottom. Move my pocket. tool pass. And you can see because of the fact that this is a half inch wide pocket and a half inch radius, I'm, I'm just, it's just going back and forth. Now that's typically you wouldn't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is you know more I'm going to make a three a three eighths, a three eighths uh, tool diameter. Notice I can also enter it as three eighths as the Nice. Use tool number one. Well, tool number is just once again. Once I turn it over, I can use the same. I can reuse the tool number. If you're using a tool changer, I would say it be easy. make sure, so tool make sure you select the tool that's in the right right pocket. <laughs> tool number only remains is, is at the layer level. It is not it's it's a mop system level. level. It's the mop level. Mop level. Okay. Yeah. Every mop has a tool. The only, the only time it doesn't have it been zero, it says use the tool, keep use the same tool from the previous. Can that behavior operation. can that behavior be changed in configuration so that tool numbers apply to all mops? Yeah, if you make go into your uh, tool library, make your own tool library, okay. and you just attach the tool library to that machining process, okay. and you just tool number one will always boom, be boom, 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 boom. That way you don't have to enter all your tool yeah, well, you're spending Make your own library. Yeah. Yeah. There's a default library in there, but you can make your own. Right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, there is a tool. I mean, uh, hard to cover all the features. You sure. Have a tool library. You can have something called Style. Which is, uh, for example, I, I use one style. I have a style that I use for, for center drill. I'll a drill hole. And I have, my, I have my spotting drill. I know I'm always going to go point of, I'm going to go, I'm going to go 30 thousand on deep. It's a one eight inch tool and 3 thousand RPM. So I can just do a drill. I put style and it fills everything in for me. And that's actually pretty useful. I don't use the There are some videos online where you can watch. It's a style name. I haven't played with it. I'm getting tired of cutting all my gear spokes for mops on rotary tables and by hand. This is silly. I've got a stepper, I've got a hobby CNC controller. Yeah, it's one of the advanced things. The style lets you pre-configure a whole mod, if you will. Uh, and I have so many different uh, end mills and materials that I'm doing, and different steel and brass and whatever. I, I always look it up differently. I'm not trying to. This is uh, somehow I go on.
So I got my pocket. Now, uh, one of the things with, with the pocket, it'll start, it'll go around one time, you know, it'll, it'll plunge down. Now, one of the things that allow you can do on a, and I'll we'll talk about a little bit about lead in. Okay, on a profile, you can do two types of lead in. You can do a tangent lead in, and you can do a what they call a spiral lead in, which is really ramping. So let's say. You know, what we were doing before is we were <coughs> at the end of every time around the tool would go straight down to the next de depth increment and go around again. What the tab does, what it does is you can specify, let's say I'm doing quarter inch material and I want to leave a bunch of little of these tabs. Maybe I only want the tab height to be a tenth of an inch. <coughs> then, I, then I want to specify how, how wide it is or how long along the profile I want to leave the bottom. So, there's two ways of doing it. You have the square tab, that essentially the tool comes along, it gets to the start of the tab point, it goes up, it goes across, it does a plunge, and it keeps going. Those are your square tabs. So, keeps more of those. You're going to do our thing. You see, you can have the first B, holy tab, further tab. Right above the top. Right above what you got out of the top. Right the tab. Oh, I see. Yeah, width and height, I want to do the type of the tail. Right there at the bottom. Right the triangle. Triangle. It would either be triangle or square. So the square goes up, up, does a plunge. Well, I better have a center cutting in the mill. The triangle does, a, does a, a ramp up one side and a ramp down the other side. So it's a little easier on your tool. Okay. So that's what most people probably were going to use is the triangle. And we generate the code. Tabs are, and you can move these around to specify where they are. Okay, usually, usually get a lot smaller. Okay, it just if you get on, if you get at a point where it'll pretty much put the tab where you want it, the place where you can't put a tab, if the tab gets to where it can't be generated, it'll put an X through this box. I'm not sure what to do. Okay, and you, typically that means you can't put a tab on a curve on a It's not smart enough to do it. Why? So essentially, what will happen is at the end you'll have these things, and you'll have to go in a hacksaw or a chisel or a screwdriver. You break them off, and then obviously you have a little nub stuff stuck on your part, but you can file or sand it off. So that's pretty useful. So those are the tabs. Now, why you have, why Davis have a problem with his, I don't know. But well, the problem one thing with the square tabs is it leaves. Marks, fitness marks where it goes up and back down. But I think I'm not making them large enough. Yeah, you have to experiment a little bit. What I found was, what I find was on, on the tabs, is, uh, especially on thin material, depending on how you're holding it, you usually have to have a substrate. And a lot of times it's hard, even though it's screwed down, you know, the thing, will, the thing will be flexible. So as your tool goes up and down, the tool will pull it up. You know, you get a pulley motion when the thing is going up. So, so your tab height is often not real precise. So you have to make sure you give it enough. Because a lot of times it's especially a fairly big piece of sheet. But it is pretty useful for cutting uh, you know, sheet stock. And pretty much anything else that's hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to fixture. If there's no other way to do it, tabs are pretty good. Uh, the other thing I want to show you is, is talk about, I want to talk about two other subjects and then we'll just do some more questions. Uh, okay, we'll talk about the tangent lead-in. Let's talk about clearance height. All of these things have a clearance height. 
what the clearance height says is anytime I'm going to make a, a rapid move, which is the, a G0 move to another position, it's going to go to that clearance height. Alright, why do we need a clearance height? Well, you might have a clamp, you might have a screw head, you might have something, something you don't want to run your tool, might be another piece of the part. <clears throat> so you need to make sure your clearance height is sufficiently high enough. Okay, so now a lot of a lot of times then, if you're if you're fairly high above your part, you you want to make sure you can you want to go down to the to just above the surface. Okay, so what you can do, what CAMBAM allows you to do, I think it's at the machining level, is have a fast plunge height. So let's say that I let's say that I had to go an inch above my part. Okay, well, if, if you don't have a fast punch height, then the tool will descend to the cutting point at the, at the MOPS punch rate, which might be pretty small. So what you can do is, you can say fast punch height, and I use it at like .05. So what will happen is, you, you move to the, above to your clearance height, you, you wrap it up to your clearance height, you wrap it over to the next start position, and you wrap it down to the .05, and then you go down to your first cutting increment of the surface at, at your plunge, plunge rate. So that'll save you a lot of time on your... Uh... So it's very important to do your clearance height. Now, let's think about if you're new to CNC, and I was making this part, okay? First thing you have to do is on your tool, you have to know how to set your Z0. Uh, now there's different ways of doing that. You can get a, you know, one, one of the most accurate ways is to use a gauge block. You get a one inch gauge block and you move your tool down and jog it down until it won't go under the tool. I use that. If I need a real precise, I have a little, little aluminum thing that has a little light that comes down and touch the tool to it. And as long as it's a conductor, as long as you're doing metal, obviously it's wood, you can work. <clears throat> now, a lot of times, so what, what I recommend doing if you're new to CNC is when I touch it off and it's an inch above the thing, I zero the Z. As long as my depth of cut is less than an inch, I run the program. I'm cutting air. Okay? If something bad happens, I haven't run it into my part. You can single, with mock, you single step, you can lower your feed rate down, uh, especially if you're on a VMC where you can't really. You want to make it real, go real slow until you're confident that it's going to work. And then when you come down to do your part, you say, I do, I go to the uh, manual entry, I say, I go up to Z0, which is now one inch above the part, and I change my DRO to one. So now that I, now I've got, now my zero is actually the top of my stock. But still when I run it, I single step it until I'm, does the first cut, a lot of times you, you can save yourself if something bad is going to happen that you didn't notice when you're cutting air. It's usually a good idea to, uh, if you see that the, you don't have your feet in speed, a lot of times that first cut, well, you see sparks coming off, <laughs> and the coolant's not on, or uh, it's in the wrong place. Sometimes, you, especially if you have a lot of extra material, you can save your stock or you can save your, your end mill because, uh, you know, there's no feel. When you're in CNC and you're used to manual stuff, once you hit the green button, you know, you can only, when he stops, you can only hit or at a certain, you know, usually, usually it's too late. So just be careful when you're, uh, when you're doing this the first time. And you, I, I know there's experienced machinists in here who've done CNC and know what will know what I'm, what I'm talking about. So that's pretty much uh, what I had planned. I was kind of, kind of going by, uh, Looking quick, so I'll take questions or anything. Any concerns? Uh, how's it handle the fourth axis? In other words, an A, a rotary axis, okay. or a W axis? Yeah, okay. Cam Bam itself does not know anything about a fourth axis. Now, if you're cutting a cylindrical part and you want to do like engrave onto a cylinder or mill something onto a cylinder, mm -hmm. there's a program called CNC Wrapper that you can download. It's 25 bucks. Okay. Okay, what you do is you generate your G code as if it were flat. A lot of times it would be an engraving type thing. And you plug, you put the G code into CNC wrapper, 
And it will change the G code, so you have to tell how it's oriented relative to your veil. It's either, the, the, it's either along the x-axis or along the y-axis. It will change that, either the x or the y, to an A or a, or a uh, 4. Okay. The, the, the thing that you have to be aware of is when you're cutting an arc in three dimensions, it's no longer an arc. It's some kind of a spline curve. Okay, so what, what has to happen is you have to take the arc in CAMBAM, CAMBAM will do this for you. You have to take your arcs and you have to divide it up into a bunch of little straight lines. And you actually have that feature, and there's an edit feature in CAMBAM. You take it, draw a circle, and make it up into very small single line arcs. Maybe, maybe uh, 2,000, 3,000 long. And, and that what you have to put in, now you can put that into uh, CNC wrapper, annual. And then in CNC wrapper, you tell it the diameter of your stock. And it'll, it'll do the coordination because the, the fourth axis goes in degrees per minute, not inches per minute. Right. <clears throat> so it all has to be coordinated, and that's what it does. So I think if you go to their website, it's. Uh, does that answer the question? That, that answered that one. Now, a W would be your knee axis on, on Bridgeport Mill. So your Z is your five inches of spindle movement, and your W is your knee. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to you'd have to have a different. Uh, I mean, as far as cam bam is concerned, uh, it, it, it thinks that the, the Z is always is moving down. So you probably I don't know if you'd be able to use the knee axis without either you'd have to make some sort of. Uh, yeah. uh, the easiest thinking, way would just be put some G code into the thing to move the thing up. To change your uh, right. I think I'm using it mostly probably for different tool lengths, for extra long drills and stuff yeah, like that. that right. More so, more so than actually machine with that, unless I'd have something out of the machine yeah. doing five inches of movement. Yeah, you should be able to just jog that knee rather than okay. putting okay. it in that program. Just one of the things. Well, you would need to make another drawing to show. Just remember the drawing here is you're looking down at from this is the XY plane. So if you want to turn it, you have to you would have to do a side, you'd have to do a different part with a different set of mops. Just like I did here, I did top and bottom, you could do side. If you wanted to do that with the using the fourth axis is what you're saying, right? Yeah, you could uh, the easiest thing to do would be to uh, put a uh, you can rotate it manually. I mean, you can do this with a with a, uh, with a rotate if it's vertical mode as well. But yeah. yeah if you have a set up just stop the requirements. Yeah, I could right. I just put in the rotate. I could put a rotate command in the mop. If you notice, the mop will have a mop. No, but here's well, here's the thing. If you look up in the mop, the, the mops themselves. Have a mop header and a mop footer. If I click on this, I get a little text box. I can put G code into the mop head. So I could put a, I could put a uh, G zero. You know, I I could put a G zero command to rotate my fourth axis 180 degrees at a, at a certain speed. And that's and so you can do a lot of you know you can do different things in the header and footer. So, for example, one of the things I do, I have a coolant on my mill. Okay, well, Cam Bam doesn't really know anything about coolant, about turning it on or off. So what I do is I'll put an M7 in my mop header if I want coolant, and I'll put an M9 in the footer. So the mop, when I run the mop, right after the tool change, it will turn on the coolant pump, and the M9 will turn it off. That's, uh, that's one way. I used to put it in my style, in my, as a default, for all of the profile, but I found out that I only want to run coolant when I'm doing steel or when I'm doing brass or aluminum, I usually don't bother. So, so that's an example, a header and footer. And now if you actually put G code, but you can also put comments in. Let's say that you want to, let's say you've got an assistant who's running your shop and you want to say, dummy, make sure that you zero the thing. You can put, you know, a G, a G code comment is just a bunch of text inside parentheses. You can put as much documentation, especially if you're doing something, you're going to make a part, you're only going to make it once a year, you want to forget, you don't forget exactly what's going on. <clears throat> now what I do is, I keep the CAMBAM file, 
But if I'm making a part that I don't remember what it does, I go back to the Kanban file and regenerate the cheat code because I might decide, well, I was running this with a, a, a 5 16th end mill and I broke my last one on some other part and I need to change the user 3 8 or something. So uh, I make a lot of one off parts. The locomotive, I don't, I'm not making production. If you're making production, you need to document your stuff. Uh, or you're making a lot of them. Now, Kanban has a lot of different features that I don't use. For example, has a nesting capability. You can draw the part. Let's say you want to make 50 of them on a big sheet of aluminum. You want to make, cut them all out in one operation. It has the ability to do that. You don't have to make 50 copies of your part. Make 50 copies to specify it. A lot of people use that. I find it confusing because you don't actually you see the tool path, but you don't actually see the parts laid out. So. Uh, a lot of people will swear by it, so it's... Well, you can just use, what is it, G54, G52 uh, fixture offset and do the same thing, right? You could, but you'd have to replicate a whole bunch of... You'd have to keep doing it. This, this one doesn't do that. Basically, you lay out your stock, and you can specify what the spacing is, and then you it'll run the same mop across <laughs> each part without having to... Uh, it's just that there's a lot of stuff here, and like I say, the... Uh, there's a lot of documentation. For example, everybody here is probably from the U.S., but uh, all of the um, stuff that's in the, in the uh, UI here is internationalized, so you can get a French version of this where all of these labels and stuff would be French. And there's a German version. <clears throat> People who are contributors have internationalized the stuff to uh, including the help screens and all of it. And all of it so, for the price of this, it's, it's all it's a nice program for the price, I tell you, I gotta say. Yeah, 150 bucks and you never have to pay maintenance and stuff, the maintenance is all done. You get you get a lot of contributors, a lot of help on the forum. Uh, now, there's another product they sell along with it that if you're gonna do, especially if you're gonna do three D stuff, there's a product called Cut Viewer. Uh, and what Cut Viewer does is an emulator, you can put in your stock and it'll actually show you what the part will look like after you build it. And especially because the 3D, 3D milling typically are very long running because you're taking very small cuts with ball end mills, especially if you're using small mills and doing a lot of roughing. So you don't really want to run your program for like eight hours and find out that something screwed up. You can run it through Cut Viewer and uh, run it through two or three minutes, whatever long it takes. And it allows you to measure the hard or do cross sections and some stuff like that. I don't use it because I just do I'm doing two and a half D parts and I'm fairly confident about the stuff or one off but for three D I if I would do three D parts I would like. Yes sir. Do you know if there's a post for a Dynapath fifty? Uh, you'd have to look on the website, but is that one of the small uh, CNC mills that no, it's not a. It's not like the dynamite. It's or not a Herco like mill, but it's it's not some. It depends on the G code. You just have to look at it. The best thing to do is look at generate code and see what the requirements are. But I know they they've done some for some pretty uh, offbeat stuff. They have to try to. Uh, if it's fairly close to G code, you can usually manipulate it. Enough. One of the other things this this does it does have the ability to invoke a program after it's generated the G code, you will fire up another program like an editor. <coughs> so if you have a stream editor like uh, you know some of the Unix stuff, it's like a stream editor. Or you can you can put in uh, uh, scripts to to do things that you can't really do in the, uh, inside the post processor facility. So you don't have to manually go in and edit stuff to. Uh, most most people have been able to uh, use it. Obviously, been able to uh, mold, get get it to work around whatever it is you want to do. Okay, so what won't it do? What won't it do? <laughs> it won't do volumetric. I know that. In other words, what what is what is it that the it won't it doesn't it won't tell you what your feed and speed would be? For like you're using Mastercam. You plug in whatever the thing, it'll it'll pop in feeds and speeds because it has a it has a, uh, a library of materials and type of thing. So it's you know there's also something called high speed machining. What high speed machining does 
is to use very small axial cuts at very high feed rates. Okay, and the, the, the thing that actually the high speed machining gives you doesn't actually machine it any faster. It takes the same amount of time to remove the tool, but it, but it makes your tool life longer. So Gibbs cam and some of the stuff like that, they calculate very complex paths. For, for example, let's say you're going, you're cutting a pocket into a corner. Okay, well what, what, is, what happens when you go into a corner is your axial engagement increases because it has to cut into the thing. So what, so that's why you get chatter in a corner. I mean, most people know when they're cutting into a sharp corner manually, you, you get this bzzz. Okay, well that's hard on your tool. So what high speed machining cam programs will do is they will actually generate slower speeds as it gets into the corner and then speed it up again. Well, cam band uses the same speed all the way around. The other thing volumetric things do is they generate Pass so that you get a constant material removal rate for production. You know, if you're going to generate a million parts, you know, peeling a second off of your each, each part saves you a lot of time. And obviously, a lot of stuff that those programs do are very complicated mathematically, or stuff that you could do but it would take you hours. So there's there's a you know there's there's also a concept trochoidal thing, which is once again a constant radio engagement. But it can raise and lower spindle speeds to operate whenever you want to. In a particular mop, yes. But it, it won't do it, uh, for example, when you're doing the, as, as, as we said, when you're doing the roughing and finishing, you have to do a separate mop with a separate spindle speed. Now, you can go in and modify your code, your G-code, and change your, you know, you can change, you can put an S word in if you want, but it won't, it currently doesn't. The you know, given mop has only got one spindle speed. So that's why the roughing and finishing has to be two separate mops. To get this that wouldn't come for why this is $150 in master cam. I think that's, yeah, 12, yeah, or Gibbs cam is 5000 a seat or whatever it is. Still have your arms in the But uh, also a lot of these other cam programs have very sophisticated CAD as well. So, as you can see, you know, I, I, in here I can draw stuff. I, mean, I can draw, you know, I can say I can draw a line and I can... I can draw a uh, circle, and yeah, I can draw a circle here. I mean, I can do some drafting, and I can, you know, has the, has the, the, the trimming and stuff, but once again, I, I, it's not a very simple part. I, I do draft stuff. Other questions? How do they handle their licensure? I mean, are you allowed to put it on as many computers yes. as you want? Yeah, it's know? pretty much a uh, honor system. You know, where you're not too many people are so I have I have it on uh, two computers. I don't run it on my mill. My mill is not connected to the internet, and uh, I don't do any updates. We have running the same thing for three, three years. I have a machine. I have a, uh, a slow machine in my shop, and I do most of the stuff in my in my office. I take it out to the machine, but I will keep the Kanban file on my shop computer in case I'm, I run it, like I said, cutting air. Sometimes I can edit the G-code and fix, you know, sometimes I forgot to put the, I left the spindle speed at 1,000. I said, oh, I forgot to, I, that's pretty easy to go into the G-code and change the spindle speed, but if it's something that I, I put my feed rate small, I got a lot of feed rate changes, <coughs> whatever, I'll, 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 I don't have to go back to my house, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, and and I, I put my license file on here, so that I didn't get the, you know, you have 40 uh, invocations. Uh, There's a trick to that, too. You just leave it open stationary in your uh, desktop. Right. And, right. As, I, as I said before, you know, you, you know, you get your 40. It's, it's enough to test it out. And obviously, you can, you can steal. You can, you can put it on other computer and get 40 more. But, uh, you know. Do they? Upgrade uh, without any charges. Yeah, yeah, you don't pay any other no. And then he comes out with pretty frequent upgrades. I'd say maybe every couple of months he'll come out with it. He'll do a fix upgrade. Because one of the things you get is you get a lot of people using this. Several, I don't know, must be hundreds, if not thousands of people using this. And every time there's a release, there's quite a few of us who will test stuff and we find a bug. There's a, you, go on, you go on to the website on the forum and say, here's, here's something that doesn't work. 
And he doesn't necessarily, you know, if there's a workaround, or you ask for a feature request, uh, you know, some, some people have very specialized stuff, and I, I, you know, if there's a way to do it without big changing the program, you know, in my mind, it's, it's stupid to try to get somebody to do a, a little minor, minor glitch just to do something you can do some other way. But if it's a bug that's going to affect a lot of people, then you know, a lot of times they'll fix it. Uh, you know, fix it fix. So, uh, Dave, how, what do you say they put about three, uh, three releases in the last year? And they always have one, which is a release candidate. We'll download the one that's for your tested one. But I was, I was trying to release Canada. He's pretty good about his quality control as far as. So I have no, no problems with it. As soon as you put that fix release, I usually do this. And what's your experience? You can tell if your G code is not working. All right, I guess we're at noon, so I will. I'll be in the, I'll be around if you see me walk around and have a question I'll be getting to, uh, to answer any other questions. But once again, there's a lot of support people.